All right, you guys, we'll, we'll go on ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everybody who is attending our virtual panel discussion today on leadership development. Thank you all for registering, and I, I think it's going to be a pretty exciting discussion. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our international sponsors, TMS Lighting, um, wow, my mind totally went blank, Planet Construction, um, VMSD, and Shop. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Genevieve Davis, who's going to lead our panel discussion today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Genevieve Davis. It's been a while since I've been with you on one of these panel discussions. Um, I am with GetGo um, right now, and I am Senior Director of Construction and Store Design, and I'm really excited to be moderating this panel for you all. Um, I'd like to um, call on, um, I'm going to call on our guest here and ask everyone to just introduce themselves. And why don't you share what does leadership mean to you? Um, Tiffany, do you mind going first? I do not mind, Genevieve. Hi, everybody. Tiffany Chen. Uh, I work with ASD Sky and specifically Sky Design, um, Vice President and Principal, and uh, lead the lead the group nationally. Um, leadership to me means having uh, an awareness and I would say a genuine servitude to help others grow and being very cognizant of what is required, both from a responsibilities perspective, but also from a uh, support perspective. Awesome, thank you, Liz. Hey, I'm Liz Rinaldi. Um, I am Vice President of Retail Design at Arc Worldwide. Um, leadership to me, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing, it's a big powerful thing. Um, and as we all, I'm sure, have experienced, when you have great leadership, it can often make your life easier. When you have really bad leadership, it can surely make your life harder. Um, but it really shapes the culture of a team. To me, they're a little bit interchangeable, culture and leadership. Um, but much like culture, leadership happens on multiple facets, kind of starting from the top. Um, and it really allows people to either bring their when leadership is good, it allows people to bring their best selves to work. That's great. Thank you, Liz. And Ray? So I'm Ray Eshide. I'm managing principal of IA's office here in New York City. Um, and I lead a team of people that is responsible for really keeping our activities focused within the city. And I think, you know, it's great to hear these ideas of leadership as well, because I think many of those concepts dovetail. To me, being a leader is, is really about vision and creating a vision which is powerful, enduring, and really helps, quite frankly, balance driving a business forward and figuring out where you need to be um, as an organization, as an individual, or as a practice. Uh, and I think that careful balance means that being a leader, you've got to make both some beneficial directions and you also have to make some very tough decisions. And I think being a good leader allows you to do all of those things create a strong vision, figure out how to get there, who and what and where do you need to be to, to get to that particular place, and then be willing to make the decisions that are, quite frankly, hard uh, without losing sight of what that vision represents. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, before we get started into our dialogue, I want to encourage the audience, if you think of questions, we want to encourage you, please type in your questions into the chat and we're, we're going to reserve the last 10 minutes or so for your questions. So please, as you think of them, just type them in and we have um, somebody offline who off camera who is uh, moderating that question uh, forum. So please do that. Um, so just getting right into the dialogue, uh, Liz, how how do you how do you lead others and how would you describe your leadership style and, and you know and leaders thinking about leadership styles like how how do people how could you recommend somebody to find their leadership style yeah yeah great question um my leadership style uh you know i'm learning and growing i think all all leaders are always evolving uh to be better i'm an empathetic leader i would say is probably the the summary of how I lead, I, I listen first. And um, I, I believe that good work comes from good people and good people come from good leaders. And so it's 
really a responsibility that I don't take lightly. Um, and it, it trickles down to the work that we do. Um, so my first approach is listening and understanding people, understanding what their motivations are. What does a good day at work look like for you? What does a bad day at work look like for you? What stresses you out? What gets you excited? And that may change based on who you're talking to. Um, so I think that adaptability is a trait that uh, is uh, necessary for good leaders to be able to adjust and adapt their style to kind of get the best and find the superpowers uh, in others. Um, developing your own leadership style we all are good at something, right? And often leaning into your own strengths is a great place to start. Um, and then try and find people that fill in those blanks. If you're a great visionary, but maybe you're not good at the details, find somebody to, that's great at the details. Um, or if you're great at the details, but maybe you lack a little bit of that big concept thinking, partner with other people that can fill in those blanks. So I don't think you have to be everything to everybody, but you have to find what your passion is and let that guide your leadership style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, I think Liz, everything you said is absolutely spot on. And I, I think one thing that I had written down in preparation is where you were talking about being aware of where you may be deficient or maybe strengthen, working on strengthening and finding the right teammates to help have um, fill in those gaps and plug those holes and help them grow based off of their strengths as well. And I think being aware um, for me and my own personal growth as a leader, being aware of where those maybe you don't always want to admit kind of traits, those aspects that if you're being really honest with yourself uh, would be something that I would encourage people who want to be leaders is recognize and be honest with yourself, have honest conversations and identify where your strengths are and maybe where those weaknesses are as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that I, I would actually continue to build upon that because I think very early in my career, I recall one of my very first mentors really in the experience. And I know Genevieve will talk about mentorship at some point in today's dialogue. Um, but his comment to me was that, Ray, you, know, you're, you, you seem to be afraid to make mistakes. And you never want to do anything wrong unless you've researched it a million times and you know, putting yourself out there was really the lesson that he was trying to teach me. And I, I think I agree with you, both ladies, Tiffany and, and Liz, because if you don't recognize the weaknesses in yourself, it's very difficult for you to be able to hire the people and build and create the teams that are going to bring all of you to that next level. And I recognize where those weaknesses are. And in fact, I think there's even several books that are around that concept of how do you, again, what's that, what's that phrase? It's like, you want to hire the people who actually do the job better than you do, mm -hmm. yeah. because yep. your goal as a leader is to bring all of those incredibly focused skill sets into one ultimate place to go. Um, so I honestly think that as leaders, and it'd be interesting to hear the two of you speak about this as well. I think if I do anything well, I'm a good generalist. And then I can tap into skills, whether that's the, the business side, and so the actual financing, the PL piece, or I can tap into the creative side, or I can actually tap into the, the, the people management side. And do I do any of those perfectly? Absolutely not. Don't, don't tell my boss that actually. But, um, but I do them well enough and I've got great people in those roles that they support me and I can actually support them as well. So that brings me to another question, um, you know, in developing ourselves and in developing others, it's really important to be able to identify what are the strengths, what are the opportunities, we all we all want to amplify our strengths and strengthen our opportunities, how, how do you go about, you know, identifying what are those strengths and opportunities, um, Ray, like it seems like you have a great grasp on where your opportunities lie and how did you kind of learn that about yourself? Uh, my therapist and I talk about it every, excuse me, uh, every, <laughs> um, well, I think again, that comes, some of it comes with time. It's not that you can't be a good leader at a young age, but I do think that that power that you have when you're new in your career, or actually even, you know, sort of not even in your career, when you're in college and you're, you're part of other organizations and what you put forward, the energy you put forward. But I think over time, we are able to sort of like sand the rough edges off of some of those figure out 
And what, what did I do that actually worked in that scenario? Was it good to sit down and have a conversation like, like Liz is talking about, the empathetic piece of the equation? I want to listen to you. I want to hear what you have to say, but then actively listen instead of immediately making an assumption about what has to happen next. And to me, that's a, a wonderful little lesson of leadership because you, you do need to balance empathy with action. And, but if you don't understand what's going on in front of you, you can make a jump in a direction that may not be the most appropriate one. So you've learned two things. You've learned how to listen. And then you've also learned again, what could I do right? What could I do wrong? Um, you know, long time from that first conversation, I have made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and I've learned from most of them. And, but then there's always some things that we're going to continue to, to challenge ourselves with and um, may constantly do. And again, I, I would tip my hat to Liz in that regard as well. I, I feel that empathy is an incredibly powerful characteristic of strong leadership. Um, but that lever between being too empathetic or being too direct is one that I constantly struggle with. How much do you listen? And then how much do you act? And what are all the goals that you're trying to set in order to figure out where that lever goes? Yeah, those are great. That those are great thoughts. Um, and I would add to that as well, when you're early in your career, you're very self-focused. How can I, what am I doing to advance myself? What am I doing to maybe impress my team? Am I doing a good job? And I think the shift comes when you start looking at your work or your contribution as how am I helping the team? How am I looking at others? Mm -hmm. Those are the start. That's the shift that starts to happen where you're saying, okay, I, I want to take on the responsibility maybe of this project and run this. And can I direct a little bit? Can I give a little guidance? Can I be there for my teammates? Mm -hmm. Maybe if you're not in a leadership position, but starting to behave like, um, or even behave like the leader you want to have. Right. Um, sometimes can be a great motivator if, as they say, in the absence of leadership lead, um, sometimes that can be a great motivator to excel you forward. Well, that's actually a I great I think that's point, a great... Right? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go. No, Tiffany, go. Tell me. <laughs> um, no, I, I think just piggybacking off of that, your your comment about, you know, be the leader you, you think needs to be there. Um, that's really important because sometimes there is a leader and, and maybe they need support and they may not directly ask you for something, but having someone jump in is incredibly, um, it showcases a lot of what I see as very innate leadership qualities and skills and necessities. And I also think it's very important early on um, in your career or when maybe you make a shift in the mentality of and, and make a choice of where you want your career to go to consider who you identify as leaders and, and why are they leaders? And even on the contrasting end of that spectrum, why what makes someone not the best leader? How can you take examples of what has affected you and Remorph it into this really positive, possibly even non-toxic approach, um, and and spin that forward. And just like what Liz was saying, for me, that shift happens when you are no longer thinking about your own self-serving gains, and you're truly in almost a, a sur sub almost subservient manner to help others and to guide guide progress forward. I and I do want to and when I. I like this because I think that too, we also have to remind ourselves that sometimes, again, we, in those scenarios, we have people on our teams who do emerge as leaders and they can emerge in, in several ways. They can emerge as subject matter experts, right? So who absolutely knows the job inside and out, like we talked about at the top of the conversation, or they can be somebody who's, who's powerful and influential within the group. Um, and even if you are the leader in that group, you may, you know, being able to manage those new personalities that are emerging and does that subject matter expert, that SME, are they really, are they, to your point, Tiffany, are they really being a leader or are they simply the expert? And sometimes I think right. we fuse subject matter expertise with leadership. And I'm sure we've all had people on our teams in the past, or maybe even today that are really, really good at what they do, but they don't want to manage people. And yep. so yep. that's part of that other discussion, right? Whether or not leading is also people management. 
And I right. think this, this is where it gets very complicated and multi layered and, yeah. and deep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There, um, and, uh, you know, as we were uh, preparing for this today, uh, mm -hmm. we were talking about the different types of leadership. I think everybody thinks leadership is people, people leadership, or they think C suite, or they think executive. Um, you know, and it is multifaceted. First of all, you're leading your own life, right? Yeah. We all lead our own lives. Exactly. You set the tone, you set your own culture, you make your bed and whatever you have to do to lead your own life, you're responsible. But there's also, you know, there's thought leadership um, that is how are you contributing to our industry um, by having a point of view? Or an opinion, you mm -hmm. know, as we think about retail in general, well, we're all, we're all shoppers, we're all um, consumers, uh, we're all living out there in the world, you have opinions, and you can, you can put forward those opinions and show leadership by, you know, what's a trend going on, you can do trend hunting. Um, you can be a subject matter expert in your own category. You can bring ideas to the team. You can bring ideas to the company that you might think would be great uh, insights. Those are all leadership qualities. Thinking mm -hmm. strategically about how you present your work, especially in a creative field. How do you think strategically about, okay, how does this design perhaps solve a business problem? Well, guess what? Those are leadership qualities. Mm -hmm. Versus here's what I did and here's what color it is and here's how big it is. So there are many ways other than people management to right. be a leader and to exhibit leadership qualities uh, if that's where you want to take your career. Absolutely. That's great. And so in, in talking about the different types of leadership, um, we talked about subject matter, expert leadership, people leadership. Is 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 people leadership for everyone, or you know, can you be like like you were saying, like can you can you be a leader without leading others? And um, and Liz, I, I think to build on what you were saying, how can if somebody who wants to become build on those leadership skills and doesn't have any direct reports and is part of a team? What, how can you build upon your skill set so that you can, when you make that jump, be more prepared? Um, well, I think so, just not to be redundant, but I think a lot of it is, you know, how do, how do you, if we look at leadership as a contribution to your work or your industry or your company, it can come in a few forms. And again, like thought leadership, I think is a great way to go about it. Look at the trends. I mean, we're in February right now. All the trend reports have come out. Start scanning them, summarize them, bring them to your manager and say, here's three trends that I think might help this client in this category. Okay, we're, you know, we're going for a athletic brand category. Here's three trends that are happening in, in that category. Those are thought leadership qualities. Um, I also think that starting, if you, if people management is your ultimate goal. One, you need to communicate that to your manager. Hey, I would like to manage people. I would like to try this. Can we try this together? Um, I've never done it before. Maybe you can help me. And maybe it starts with managing a project, managing, hey, maybe let me try and figure out how to craft direction to give to others versus doing it myself. Because that's the biggest hurdle for me in creative people management is stepping out of the way, <laughs> moving out of the way. You are no longer, when you're in a people management role, you're no longer doing the work. You're guiding others to do the work. Mm -hmm. Totally different skill set. Mm -hmm. Much harder, in my opinion. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier. I could just do that, but you can't. You have to guide people. You have to grow people. And if you do, it actually could be detrimental to them. What do you, would you want your boss stepping in and doing all your work for you? Absolutely not. So um, developing those skill sets of, okay, if I wasn't actually doing the work, how would I communicate the work that needs to be done? And I think those are the little levers to pull to tiptoe your way into people management. Mm -hmm. 
but I lo would love to hear Ray and Tiffany's yeah. thoughts on this as well. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in quickly. Cause again, I, I do agree with the overall pieces. I, I think that, again, I think that it's a very interesting thing. We think about leadership from those perspectives, because um, I, I, there are many SMEs and there are many people who really are experts and, and can lead from that position without people management. Um, and so I think that's you know, a very valid point. And quite frankly, I, I think those sole contributors have a lot to play. And it's a different look because I think most of us do think when we talk about leadership, we're looking at our boss or our boss's boss or the, you know, the CEO. Um, but we can also look maybe at the CFO or the CTO and the, the relatively limited teams and the great degree of independence that a lot of those teams have. I think to me, the technology side of our business is very much embedded in that space. There's a lot of interesting personalities, and I'll use that term loosely, um, who are very, very dedicated to what they do. And they are heads down in the weeds, but they are absolutely leaders in their field. And so I, I do agree with you. There's, it takes an interesting temperament to want to lead people and to want to, again, I think as we started the conversation, create a vision for what that leadership looks like and what that, again, goal of that team or that group or that organization is going to do. Um, and so I, I, think, I think it's an interesting decision. Quite frankly, I would argue that, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, that's kind of, that's aggressive. I would posit that it is more powerful to have the one-on-one -on -one engagement with somebody and to have that conversation as you recommended, Liz, just talk to not only your boss, talk to your peers, talk to your friends, about things that really engage you and, and what does that mean? But I would also say that you probably in your, in your development, um, either as a kid or again in college, you know, if you're, you're on the, you know, the rush committee or you're on the, the prom committee or you're, you know, you're, you're probably already starting to see those things that you like and what gets you excited. Is it the designing of the exhibition or what you're doing, or is it just engaging with your friends and always being the ringleader? And so take those ideas back to your boss. And uh, or actually we keep saying boss, take those to your, your group, your, your inner circle of confidence and think about what happens next. I think I have one more thing to add <clears throat> to both of yours, um, your dialogue, because it's it, it echoes a, a lot of what I believe um, supports anybody interested in be, you know, broadening their leadership or enhancing it or evolving it. And um, one of the most important things I would recommend, no matter where you are and what age you are and how tenured you are, is just to, and Ray, you kind of um, mentioned this a little bit, is ask questions. Ask others questions about what you're doing that's succeeding ask others questions about what you're doing that could be um, could be modified. Ask others questions about what their tasks are and what succeeded for them in their roles, even if their industry has nothing to do with yours or to Ray's point, their department has nothing to do with yours. Um, the more questions you ask, which kind of goes back to um, one statement that I had prepared, which is, as you become more of a leader, I believe you listen more and you say less. But in that preparation, as you ask questions, really remember that most of us are most successful when we are taking a, a collaboration and um, accumulation of feedback and being honest with ourselves and truly taking our blinders off of ambition and other, other characteristics and considering what that person may say. And you may circle back and you may say they're wrong and that's okay, but you've taken your blinders off and you've considered it. And so ask the questions, listen more and honestly consider what someone says so that you can make your own informed decision and tailor how you think leadership should be. Great point. Tiffany, in our um, in our prep session yesterday, you had mentioned that your firm does a really great job of identifying high performers and you know supporting people in their career growth. When you're looking for your high performers, what are some of the skills and qualities that you're keeping your eyes open for? That's a, that's a great question, and I think and a complicated one. Um, 
one of the ways that we identify high performers is by simply standing back and watching what happens organically. Um, I actually just had a conversation this morning with someone about how there's a lot of action happening within our studio that is very organic. And um, I think some of the characteristics might simply be as simple as kindness. I think um, leadership has something to do with proactivity and how someone can physically be proactive for projects or ideas or whatever the case may be in a very practical business function. But from a person to person perspective, I'm going back to a bit of what Liz has said, it, it really does a good leader a definition of a good leader has to do with how they react to individuals and not necessarily how they guide a group. And while guiding a group is critical for business purposes, how they interact and engage and react with individuals. Um, I myself have had failures with individuals that I hope I've learned from. And, you know, and I think really that individual interaction is critical for leaders to remember that nobody's the same. And we all have our own daily stresses and, you know, commutes and um, factors that affect what they need. And, and I can't remember who mentioned it yesterday, but someone even mentioned, you know, as a leader, you may engage with one person and that may be the only time you engage with them. And what kind of impression are you leaving? What, how do they feel when you've gone through a huge markup session? How do they feel when you had to talk about something very personally affecting about how they can grow, but it's a real vulnerable moment? Do they feel positive or do they feel disheartened? Do they want to come back tomorrow? And all of that, I think, individual experiences for us in our studio, um, it makes a difference in how we evaluate, you know, do people have a following? And that's actually a question that we that comes up uh, as we talk about promotions and considerations is, mm -hmm. do they have a following? And that's not, you know, socially, that's that's truly like within the office. Do people naturally follow them and why? And and. The following is probably one thing that we do talk about a lot because usually we're not mandating it. It's very organic. And um, and you know, obviously, I think a lot of other aspects come into play. One's work ethic, one's honesty, one's fairness. You know, can they accept if we say, I'm not sure that looks like we've really we're giving the client our best? How do they react to that? And how do they bring that forward? Um, and then how do they react if you know, a client didn't give them the best feedback. Is it truly deflating? You know, how, how, what is their maturity level to bounce back? And that's, those are, those are very hard mm -hmm. personal reflections um, of individuals in response to their relationship with other individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would also add on to that, the, um, and all of that's spot on and wonderful. And if we all could reach, reach, reach those traits, we would be just full of a world of wonderful leaders. Um, the ability to ask for feedback or the ability yes. to reach out and ask for help mm -hmm. is a leadership quality that I don't think is talked about a lot. And I think early in our careers, we're <clears throat> so taught and ingrained to prove ourselves and you know, I can take this on and I don't want to ask for help and I don't want to look stupid and, oh my gosh, I, I don't want anybody to know that I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, when many of us don't know what we're doing all the time and we're just, you Has know, that, adapting as we go. <laughs> has it really changed? <laughs> <laughs> but I think the difference is when you realize that it's not just about you and you can ask for help. And if you do surround yourself and you have good leaders and good teammates and people who can fill in your blanks, then that act of, of asking and reaching out or asking for feedback and say, hey, I'm, I'm preparing this you know, presentation. Can we go through it? So I'm my best. So I'm representing the work best. Mm -hmm. Those are like the little leadership uh, qualities that are often, you know, you don't think, you don't think about a leader asking for help. Um, but 
I ask for help all the time. I'm sure we all do. <laughs> um, so yeah, that would be just one, one more thing to add on to that. I think that's a really interesting place to be is figuring out, uh, again, you're right. We're all, I, I heard everyone's introduction. We're all at senior levels in our career. And it's tough sometimes to admit you don't know something. Um, and you know, that, that excuse of, well, in my day, we did it this way mm -hmm. and it doesn't really pass anymore. And being able to be updated. I think, I, I think Liz, that's actually, if I were going to self analyze, um, that's one of my biggest challenges is constantly trying to be both up to date, as you mentioned earlier, on what's going on in the industry, what's happening in the market, where are the right opportunities and, and how are we engaging with um, you know, those balances of, you know, how often do I get to work in Revit? How often am I using and you know, putting, you know, producing an Enscape rendering or how am I using 3D Max? I mean, there are programs that didn't exist when I was in college. And so therefore, you know, my limitations there um, are challenging and being able to fully admit that even though I'm running this place, I don't know how to do that is sometimes you're like, oh my God, I'm completely exposing myself. Um, but I actually think sometimes it helps you be a better leader. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I definitely had to ask a junior designer to help me build something out the other day because I was trying to jump in and then realize that I actually was not as good as I thought I was. Wait, wait a minute, what is that? Oh, cool. oh okay. <laughs> that used to be I do know how to export a PDF, so you don't have problems there. <laughs> that touches on a topic that I personally am really interested in, which is vulnerability in leadership and how, you know, showing, showing, an, you know, your vulnerability makes you a stronger leader. Um, do you, Tiffany, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, uh, lots, lots, lots of thoughts about being vulnerable and being a leader. And um, I, I, I was going to piggyback on um, what Ray and Liz were saying, but I think this also connects because, you know, as as you depart further and further away from responsibilities you may have once had and, you know, your responsibilities have shifted, I think um, part of being a leader is being open to things being done differently. Um, for me, that's been a huge thing. And I think, Ray, to your point about technology and processes and, you know, I mean, that's that's just a reality. Things move quickly and you have to be open. And, and even when it has nothing to do with hardware and software, there may be processes that generations have picked up that feel more efficient and comfortable that you have to be open to as well. Um, I'm sorry, Genevieve, I lost track of the question you asked. Um, vulnerability and showing vulnerability, vulnerability yes. making you a better leader. Well, I will say that the, what I just did just now about recognizing that maybe you exactly. forgot, you know, maybe you forgot something that happened. Um, for me, I think vulnerability is a critical part. And I, I would um, offer that vulnerability goes hand in hand with humility I think you have to, as you grow as a leader, you have to remain humble with everything that you do. You have to remain humble that you may have forgotten something. You have to be vulnerable that um, there are, as much as you know, everything that's happening and you know our giant spinning wheel and multiple back burners in our head of tasks that need to be happened, you have to expose yourself and slow down when you speak with your teams. I think slowing down is a um, very important part and sometimes a very hard part for leaders to do because as much as we say, oh, remain humble, you know, we, we, we are also occupied with the things that we need to get done. And um, when you do slow down, I feel like you open yourself up to things out of your control and things that, um, well, a lot that's out of your control that may not be as important to you, but it's definitely very important to the people you work with. And that aspect of vulnerability for me is something that um, I'm constantly working on and trying to be open to my own faults and course correcting in every single instance. It reminds me of, um... There's a TED talk. I can't remember who it was. She was wearing a pink suit. I think she worked for Eileen Fisher. She was talking about the difference between 
corporate leadership. And I think she was B Corp. Anyway, and maybe we all can relate to this in a town hall. Typically we go in a town hall and our leaders or our executives are have a, a whole, you know, 15 minutes of all the great things we've done and let's pat ourselves on the back and here's the quarterly report and we're so great, rah, rah, us, yada, yada, yada. And she had a twist on that and was like, you know, we tend to have a lot of self-congratulation. I think it's a cultural thing in this country. Um, and, but she put a spin on it and said, Good leaders don't just talk about the good things they do. They talk about the help they need to move to the next level and to say, you know what? Yeah, we're doing okay, but we really need to do this or do that or move forward in a different direction. I really need your help to do that. Yeah. Instead of just saying all the great things we did, say, here's where I actually need you guys to bring your ideas to help us get to where we want to go. And I thought that was an outstanding example of vulnerability at the highest level because you're nothing without all of the people we're, we're all working together toward hopefully the same direction um and good leadership and so it, it was refreshing and and maybe i'll pull it up and send it to, if i can find it um it was refreshing to hear that perspective that leaders don't always have all the answers and they don't always do all the things and they don't just sit there and write the paychecks. They need help. And we're all part of that. I think the more you understand how you're part of the bigger solution can also help you develop the leadership skills and, uh, and understand how you as a leader could then contribute to the overall vision. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you were, we already talked about you know, my vulnerability in that sense. And I think, um, it is a part of being an empathetic leader. I do think there's a, there again is a, a really careful line though, sometimes that you've got to be able to understand. And, and I, I'm not going to say again, I'm an expert at it because I, I'm, I definitely tip back and forth at times. It's, it's difficult. Let's just say again, challenging business scenario. We've all been in this before. You have to make difficult decisions. What product lines are you cutting? Where do you have to slow back? Where might deliveries have to shift or, um, you know, where do we have to extend them? Where do we have to ask our people to work overtime uh, in order to get something done? And how much pressure can you put on people? And then, so therefore, you know, again, the, I'll, I'll go back to Liz's first point about empathy. Sometimes empathy can be a real vulnerability because you need to know when to basically uh, to stop your heart and put on the different hat that you have to in order to make the business decision in order to move forward. Because ultimately you have to almost recycle it back to the original level of empathy, which is if I don't do this, I may have to do something that's gonna affect two people, but if I don't do it, it's gonna affect 30 people. And it's hard when you're sitting in the room with somebody or you're speaking to a group and realizing what you really have to do. Um, so I think, you know, and in that case, accessing your level of vulnerability and understanding personally where it's beneficial and where it's challenging, I think is another level of what we're talking about with leadership. Maybe if we summarize even all of those ideas, these individual buckets that we're talking about are going to contribute to that person that's hopefully in front of you. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about how you wrap that together um, and and be that person that you want to be. Because I guess I would also maybe switch the conversation just a little bit to say, you know, I think a lot of times too, we think about leadership and I love your TED Talk uh, dialogue because I actually, I really enjoy TED Talk. I love, uh, there's some interesting podcasts and we and I, we all probably do listen to a lot of these things that, that are focused on what does leadership represent? Because we all want to be better leaders. But I also think selecting the people like you just mentioned that you really want to emulate is incredibly important. Um, you know, without you know, trying to put too fine a point on it, I mean, we can look throughout history and we can identify people who were leaders who did terrible things. Mm -hmm. uh, or even in our current environment, we look at people who are heads of organizations or corporations who we think should be powerful leaders. And in some ways they are, but then when you start digging underneath just a little bit, you realize that sometimes these are actually really terrible people. And so how, what kind of leadership style are we all trying to put? 
together for ourselves? Are we trying, are we focused on understanding? I think this is where you're going, Genevieve, understanding our weaknesses and then being able to work in a style around them that is actually going to, again, be powerful and endearing, and give us the team that we want so that we're actually happy when we go home. Or are we going to be that person who absolutely gets the job done, who probably does year over year sales increases, but quite frankly, I can't stand going in to talk to on a daily basis. But those are both leaders. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think all of us are actually probably in the former category, <laughs> just in the couple of hours we've spent together. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting to think about how each of those elements can come together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I did want to definitely get a chance to talk on, um, to touch on mentorship. And mm -hmm. I know that from my experience, it had, it, it can be very, it, so first of all, it could be tricky to figure out who would make a great mentor or who to ask to help for help to be your mentor. So figuring out who to ask, but then even when you find somebody that you think would be a good mentor, how do you go about asking that person and how do you maintain that relationship? I think that that's a question that's um, something that a lot of people could use some advice on. Um, Tiffany, do you want to take this one? Sure, I'll take it. Um, you know, it it is tricky. And I think we touched, we all touched a little bit on it already, which is um, to expose yourself as much as possible to, to people that both within, um, I would say your immediate circles and, but very much also to people that are outside of your <clears throat> circles. I think there's a lot of different avenues to find these mentors. Um, I have found them through volunteering. I found them by accident, um, just by simply being exposed to them. And, and you don't, I, I think the recognition that mentors can happen in all levels they don't have that person doesn't have to be older or and doesn't have to have more years experience than you you can mm -hmm. find um and be inspired or gain knowledge by people that are doing things that you are you are simply affected by who are younger who maybe are still in school and that comes by again having an open mind um i think not having an ego and also being aware of um, as Ray was just saying, what type of people they are and what type of leader they are, and also what you want to pull from that person. I mean, the reality is if you have someone that's maybe not the best person, but they're really successful at business, and maybe it's somebody who you're not even personally connected to, you can just read about them on online and, you know, maybe, or maybe read a book about them, figure out what it is that you, that you're looking for. Um, within, say, um, a, a studio environment, Liz has already said it, have conversations. Some people might be very happy to share their knowledge, and, and all it does is start with the conversation, and that takes a little bit of bravery and courage to potentially be rejected, but I think that goes back to your question about vulnerability, Genevieve. As leaders, you have to be um, a little brave and able to take the risks and be prepared for rejection. Um, but what might happen is if someone rejects you, they may be able to guide you to someone you weren't even considering. And I, I think having those conversations and doing the work to find people is how you find mentors and just being open-minded about it. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of those things. I love the idea of it doesn't have to fit one mold. It can be somebody within your peer group. I actually have on my personal goal list every two weeks, have a conversation with somebody who either I haven't talked to in a long time or reach out, or is it a colleague? Because now we're all remote and I, know, I don't see some of my colleagues try and set up a little coffee chat um, to keep one that builds your helps your network keep growing, but also just to catch up. If you're earlier in your career and you want more mentorship, I mean, I don't know a single person that isn't happy to, if they get the request, hey, can I get some advice? Hey, can I listen to you talk about yourself for half an hour? I mean, most, <laughs> most people are <clears throat> honored, happy to- I'm excited to, for that. Are we doing that later? That's right? <laughs> <laughs> so- uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, risk in asking to meet somebody or having a coffee date. I would say come prepared with a few questions, do your homework, 
a little bit to, you know, have a couple of questions prepared. Again, like, uh, like Tiffany was saying, understand maybe what you want to get out of it. But if you do that all the time, if you make that a habit, then it's not just a state of urgency. If you're, you know, you're ha happen to be looking for a job or happen to be, you know, trying to get something immediate, make a habit of it. Have lots of different mentors that can fill perhaps different gaps in your life or different areas of advice. And then, and then you, you can synthesize all of that information and make a decision on perhaps what's best for you. I'll also say to that, Liz, the, just from a very real actionable item that if you are having these conversation with your, with your potential mentor or your mentor, um, send them questions ahead of time so that they can be prepared. I mean, even, even this panel, we had a prep, a prep call to prepare ourselves mentally. And I think, um, as someone who has been asked questions, I, I personally very much appreciated having that forethought so that I could make sure that I wasn't giving a very reactionary or off the cuff response. I was truly helping them succeed in their answering their question. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I can keep going as well, I but kind of, I know you've got, we, I think you said we had a time, we wanted to leave some time for Q&A. Yeah, we can transition over to Q&A, but I think that those are wonderful suggestions. Absolutely. And I also would just throw in there that, you know, I encourage you can also speak with your manager and ask your manager to introduce you to somebody who they might know, um, who's in senior leadership, who uh, might be really strong in an area that your manager might think that you might need to develop in. Um, and that could be a good way to also meet um, meet up with somebody as well, um, just through your office. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe I would pause it very quickly because I do think that this, um, sometimes you know don't think about mentorship also as being a very formal process. Mm -hmm. You could do it this way, but also I think you'd be sometimes surprised if you just think about the people that are actually influencing you in your life. Mm -hmm. They also have a key mentorship capability. And whether that's, again, early in my career, as I said before, it was one of my first supervisors. Um, I've had in, in friends over the year that I've met through networking, like, quite frankly, like RDI, um, that do still remain mentors. And because I didn't think of them as starting that way, but it's amazing how in, in your career guidance, how just having that next conversation, whether it's, again, over a glass of wine or it's at an event, really will help to shape you. So the formality of mentorship doesn't need to necessarily be there either. It's a wonderful point. So we have one, uh, one of the questions we have from the audience. Um, do you or your companies have any formal programs or policies to identify and engage potential leaders in growing from staff to management? Anyone want to jump um, in? Do that? You want to jump in? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead Ray. Go ahead. You go first. Um, yeah, my company does. We're part of like a giant conglomerate um, of all kinds of agencies. So we we certainly have presentation classes, conflict management courses, um, preparing to be leaders. Um, a lot of that is around people management, to be very honest, I think, because that is a different hurdle um, that many people need to decide if that's a hurdle they want to cross over. So we, we have a very, very rich library of courses to take. I will also say though, I had a designer who was really struggling to uh, step out of her comfort zone. Um, and she took an improv class, an improv comedy class. And there is awesome uh, nuggets of development in, in improv comedy. So these are things, I mean, we, she expensed it. We were able to support her in that. Um, because she wanted to get outside of her comfort zone. She wanted to connect with people. She wanted to be stronger presentation skills, things like that. But having taken that class, she like elevated, you know I mean, I like, that's terrifying to me <laughs> and I to stand up in front of an audience yeah. and do improv. But was this her idea um, or was it, um, like the company's idea? It was her idea. It's phenomenal. Um, so now I'm sharing it with all of you and it's a your great idea. idea. That sounds great. Although I'd like to do it as a wine tasting class. Yeah, booze will help for sure. <laughs> awesome. Um, we have another question here. 
Um, have you had to overcome any barriers or stereotypes on your leadership journey? Um, I can, I, sure. I mean, I, I, I think that the, um, it's funny. I mean, maybe uh, you might argue that the career path I chose within creative tech, our creative field um, was one that, you know, sort of helped with that. But, you know, so as a gay man, I think that it's, uh, there is a stereotype that sort of exists around, you know, what my level of, of leadership is going to be and how I'm going to deal with people and where my empathies are going to lie. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, been a challenge at certain points and sometimes it's actually been a benefit because the expectation was there that i'm going to understand something a little bit better than somebody else but i guess i i would say that um these are these are challenges that we all face everyone's going to have an issue and i, I actually be really interested to hear tiffany and, and liz comment on this as well because um you know, we're, we're trying to be in an environment today where we are more aware of people and what makes them different and why that actually benefits the whole. So, um, but again, I'm also perhaps a little older than you guys. And so therefore, you know, I growing up in a time where being an out gay person is maybe not as acceptable uh, as it is today in certain career areas. And so being able to be in a quote unquote safe space in creative, although many of you know that I actually spent uh, almost 20 years in banking although still on the creative side, um, I, I think in some ways um, allowed more growth, but at the same point, it sort of continued to channel me in one particular direction. Um, now I do feel that I do have more opportunities. Have, uh, and maybe again, this part of a personal growth path, um, but seeing people coming up today, seeing people grow and evolve, um, regardless of um, you know, their identification, I think is something that we all in our jobs as leaders today have to support. And if it makes us uncomfortable, we have to figure out a way to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. And again, recognize people for their talents and grow their talents because ultimately it's only gonna help all of us uh, in our successes. Yeah, Liz, Tiffany, do you have any you wanna... stories you wanna? <laughs> well, my only story is I, you know, I was, uh, I was at a job for 10 years right out of school. And I think because I started at when I was like 22 years old, I never got past the perception of being the young one. Um, and it, and I felt it by the time I left, I felt like I was never really going to advance because the perception of, of who I was um, was the young, and, it, and I was the young one. I was, everybody else was like 10 years older than me. Um, and so when I finally left that and kind of started fresh and was able to make a first, a, a new impression, it allowed me to bring my whole self to work, which I think is kind of what Ray was saying too. Mm -hmm. Like, you need to find a place where you can bring your whole self to work and kind of leave the baggage. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes it does require you to get up and go change your, you know, as I say, change your decisions or change your conditions. Um, but you know, once I, you know, sometimes you just need a fresh start and you change the scenery and, mm -hmm. and a new opportunity to, to show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think everything that you've both said has, is very true when, whenever you encounter any barrier or stereotype, I think I count myself lucky that I haven't encountered a ton other than, you know, the occasional ego um, that I, th I think I naturally feel um, like I want to prove myself when someone doesn't naturally, you know, um, acknowledge maybe the expert level. And I think to your point, Liz, um, at least what I've encountered is when I was younger, not necessarily now, but I, I think that youth aspect, when you come into a room and you know your, you know your stuff and you have your confidence, but someone's still disregarding you because you just simply look like you just came out of school. And I think that that's a, 
Um, an important aspect for leaders, and, and a little bit back to your question, Genevieve, is um, we have a bit of an ethos within, within our studio that we, we don't have a lot of titles within our studio purposefully because we acknowledge that if you are creative and um, contributive to with your ideas, it doesn't matter what level of tenure you have. And I think with that respect, um, it, it's important to, to have your confidence. And like you said, Liz, sometimes you have to leave the baggage and recognize the baggage and maybe leave the baggage. Um, for me, the barriers I've had to overcome on my leadership journey have actually just been personal ones. I mean, if I'm being really vulnerable, it's just been personal ones, you know, recognizing where, what my, um, what my bike ruts are, where my default lines are, what I fall into and how to get out of those bike ruts, what I naturally want to do versus what maybe is more beneficial to the team. And, you know, reactivity is very important to stop and ask questions as opposed to, well, I've, I know I, I know this because I've experienced this before. Um, and sometimes you have to let people fail. So for me, the barriers and stereotypes are, are personal ones. Yay. <laughs> very true, though. Mm -hmm. Very relatable. I think, we all, I think we all have those. I don't think we'd be <laughs> human if we did it. So. Right, right. We do. And I think we we all have personal barriers, and I think many of us unfortunately have also experienced um, you know some some external barriers as well. But the great pieces of advice. Um, I see that we are just about at time, and that concludes um, all of the questions that our audience had. So. I really want to thank you guys for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a phenomenal discussion, and I'm sure that our audience, um, both the folks on live right now, as well as our friends who are going to be watching this um, after it's being taped and put up online, um, everyone's getting a lot out of it. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And um, I'm really happy that I was able to make these connections with you all. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you to all of our panelists, everyone who showed up. Again, thank you to our sponsors, Planet Construction, TMS Lighting, Shop Marketplace, and VMSD. And we really hope you guys will come back and uh, check out our panel on onboarding and hiring in four weeks. And again, just thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.